let's uh, go over Hebrews chapter 2. I'm just going to read through it and comment on anything that uh, comes to mind without a lot of preparation. And so chapter 2 it starts in my Bible at the very bottom, like half the verse. Uh, so, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And so, previously in chapter 1, it was speaking of how Jesus is the Son of God. He is who he claimed who he was. This is the epistle written to the Hebrews, so it was kind of important at that time that, uh, you know, and even to now, kind of focused on the Jewish people, uh, making sure that they knew who that Jesus was who he proclaimed he was. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He was the Son of God. And uh, he, he proclaims his deity. He gives many, many evidences, you know, from Scripture how uh, Jesus was the one that was prophesied of. And, and, you know, in these prophecies, you know, they proclaim his deity. Um, he's higher than all the angels and everything, basically, that he's equal with God. Um, so he is divine. Uh, and just the fact that, you know, he is the son of God, he is the son, you know, uh, by nature, he is, you know, he shares the same divine nature with the Father. So, he's saying that, you know, th it's important that we, uh, we know these things and that we keep them in mind, basically. And so, in verse 2, it says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. And so, yeah, that's uh, interesting to me. I guess you kind of have to read probably a lot of this into the context. Um, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience uh, received a just recompense of reward. So is he basically saying that so all these things of Jesus, you know, that were said of Jesus are true, and basically, uh, you know, those um, and those who you know disobey the sayings of the Bible, you know, are are punished. So you know, just like. The Hebrews, the, or the Jews, you know, were punished in the Old Testament for not following the ways of God, and, you know, also, if, you know, people don't put their faith in Christ, as he said, then, you know, they are punished for that as well, eternally. I don't know if that's where, what that's kind of speaking of, uh, the words spoken of by the angels, um, so that's interesting. So he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. And... Um, I can see how Calvinists could use the, his own will thing. Anytime anything like that pops up, they can say that everything is according to God's will, even murder and, you know, child abuse and everything else. You know, they say that that pleases God, which makes God, you know, it uh, maligns his character. <laughs> but, but basically saying, you know, I think kind of like I explained how the prophets and everything uh, proclaimed all this stuff and even though the Jews were still disobedient to it, even though they knew they were punished, you know, they were uh, put in exile and stuff like that. And he's saying, you know, how much greater, you know, if we neglect so great salvation, um, not just like a physical provision that God had for the Jews or so, but, uh, you know, the eternal aspect of this, um, you know, how much, how much worse will this be? For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now this was an interesting verse that I did look into a little bit because I figured when somebody reads, uh, you know, he didn't put the angels into subjection to the world to come, 
I think that a lot of people will interpret that as speaking of the Millennial Kingdom. And that is not the case. And so I wanted to see what some people said about this verse. And, you know, at first glance, I kind of think that it also seems like, you know, eternity, heaven, the world to come is, you know, the other world, the other life that awaits us, you know, our home. But a lot of the commentators seem to think that it's kind of speaking of this age of um, Christ coming, you know, living on the earth and reigning, uh, you know, not in the little kingdom, but I mean when he was born and the life that he lived and, you know, starting basically his ministry, you know, this dispensation or this age of, um, you know, how he made disciples and, you know, the apostles and they, they started churches and all this. And so there's the kingdom on the earth currently as the church, you know, as the believers, uh, as Christians. And uh, they, a lot of the commentators say that this references to the Old Testament where they saw that time to come when the Messiah would come, that um, that was the world to come. And so basically it's speaking of from the time that Christ came into, like, you know, into eternity or until the full consummation when, you know, all the uh, enemies of Jesus are made a footstool. And so that's kind of what the world to come is. So when he says the world to come, he doesn't really mean necessarily something future at that point. He's also, he's speaking of the present. Um, he's just using an old refer Old Testament, you know, language re reference. Because this is speaking to, you know, basically the, the Hebrews, the Jews. And so he, he brings up the Old Testament a lot. And, you know, so they understand this. Uh, they may understand this, you know, more than we would. Or Gentiles at that time, you know, we have to look into this a little more. But, um, and so basically, again, I think that he's also saying, you know, that, you know, Jesus is higher than the angels, maybe uh, with that statement, how, uh, you know, proclaiming the deity of Christ still, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit more, but he continues on. See if it'll zoom out. But one in a certain place, one in a certain place testified, saying, "What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest? Let me see, or that thou visitest him?" So it said somewhere in scriptures, "What is man?" And it looks like maybe in the Psalms. Uh, my Bible has Psalm 8.4 as a reference, but I'm not sure there. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? And so, maybe he's saying in the son of man here is the reference to Jesus. You know, we have to let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament. And so we see references of Jesus in the Old Testament. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou... Uh, crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And so this basically backs up, you know, what he has said up here. For unto the angels hath he put into, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. And then down here, you know, when he references the Old Testament writing, he says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet speaking of the Son of Man, which a lot of times people would say the Son of Man proclaims the humanity of Christ because Jesus Christ was fully divine and fully human. And, you know, we, we, see, we saw previously in Hebrews chapter 1 and even how the angels worship him, which I think is a great testament to his deity because, you know, basically the angels were created to worship God only, and the only other, you know, instance that we have, you know, is the fall of Satan and stuff, which scripture doesn't explain everything, and we can't fully understand that, maybe uh, angels had some kind of more of a free will at some time or something, I don't know, but basically the angels were, were created to, to uh, worship God, and we don't see them worshiping man or anything like that, and so when they worship Jesus, that that's basically saying, you know, he is God, because, you know, that's 
they do, but, uh, you know, so basically in chapter 1, and what we just read here, how the angels are not in subjection to the world to come, but he is. And so we see over and over again how he is higher than the angels. But then here it says in verse 7, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And speaking of the Son of Man, and I think it's speaking of his uh, his humanity, you know, how he was born as a man. And so in that sense, he was lower than the angels. But, you know, he truly is, uh, you know, his person is divine and he is above the angels. And so all things are subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. And so that's kind of how I was saying that the age, the world to come is basically, you know, speaking of the present time for them, referencing the Old Testament, uh, because, you know, the process of putting all things in subjection under him had begun, but then, you know, it also continues on to, like, the full consummation. And still, this is just, Hebrews is just a great epistle on Christology. This is just all about Jesus. And it's something we can all be excited about. I get excited just reading this, and I want to study it more and look at the commentators, and I want to understand this all more, but I'm just reading through it now, just... But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. Okay. So basically, I guess the angels don't really die, you know, uh, like humans do. Um, and crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And so we have more of the atonement there. Jesus Christ tastes death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things. And I guess that him tasting death for every man is kind of a refuse Calvinism, the limited atonement, in a sense. Of course, they wouldn't agree with that, and they would have their own interpretation of that, but, you know, obviously from Scripture, uh, every man should mean every man. They'll say, well, then, does that mean that every man is saved? Well, no, but uh, every man, you know, has that possibility to repent and to choose Christ. Um, so, you know, they have stupid arguments and views for that but they'll never be convinced. <laughs> Rarely, I'm sure. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. For whom are all things. They're all for him, they're all by him, and bringing many sons unto glory. Okay, sons uh, by adoption, those who turn to Christ, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. Mm. Very interesting there. So who is the captain of their salvation? Is that speaking of Jesus Christ? I would think so. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Again, that's proclaiming his deity. And so it's like, in what sense is uh, men being led to Christ, bringing Christ uh, perfect through sufferings? It's kind of interesting. That's, you know, that's something that can be looked into more. Uh, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one. I guess that kind of explains it, continuing on. Uh, so, uh, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
you know, so we are one with Christ, basically. And um, I guess, you know, he suffered, and so we're going to suffer with him. Um, you know, and more specifically, the people at the time, you know, it feels kind of goofy for me to say anything about me suffering, because there's people that are way off, a lot worse off than me. And, uh, you know, all of us, I'm sure anybody that's watching this, um, you know, and at the time they were being persecuted, they were being hunting like, hunted like dogs and killed, right? <laughs> or, you know, if they, they spoke against things, you know, they were being executed and don't have maybe all the rights and stuff that we do these days, all the freedoms. But basically, you know, it's still true. It, it's, you know, we're one with Christ, and so uh, I guess, you know, our salvation is made perfect through our suffering, and, you know, uh, the same goes for him, I guess, through our suffering. Uh, and in what way is our salvation made perfect through our suffering? I think it means kind of that our suffering is kind of a proof of our salvation, our suffering, you know, willing to die for our faith, kind of, uh, it kind of makes the faith, uh, gives it more validation, I guess, but then, you know, there are people that are in cults that are willing to die for their faith, too, so then there's that, but I think that's kind of what I get from it, but let's continue on, 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I behold I and the children which God hath given me. And so this is the psalm. Uh, I don't know if it was David who wrote this or not. Is he saying that this is like the words of Jesus? Talking about our brethren. Or... Hmm, I don't know. But, you know, obviously, I mean, we're, we're the children of God along with Jesus. We're not sons of God in the same sense that Jesus is. But uh, we belong to the same family, um, though us by adoption. 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part, part of the same. And so... I mean, that's interesting, too, just reading that. And it's just amazing how the Bible can just impact you just reading it, and it just comes alive to you, and it's like, uh... So, yeah, I mean, we're the same, too, in the, in the sense that Jesus became a man, and, you know, he shared that with us, and that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. Now, that's very interesting, uh, you know, in, which, in what sense is, is the devil destroyed... Uh, because, you know, we see later, we see or previously, I guess, in the epistles of Paul and stuff, talking about how the devil wanders around like a roaring lion. Like, you know, he's still around, so he wasn't, you know, uh, vanished or anything. Uh, so that's interesting, uh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power over death that is the devil. And that obviously has to do with the atonement. And I think this is where the crisis victor view comes from. Uh, might be a, bit, a big main verse for it, but I mean, I guess that every version of the atonement would get something from this. But uh, basically, the, the crisis victor is, you know, he has victory over the devil, but it's kind of a weird uh, view of the atonement that basically, like, Satan had had power over men, and basically, like, God had to trick the devil by becoming a man, and then, uh, dying, and then, you know, uh, then, like, when God was put to death in the flesh, uh, like, Satan overstepped his bounds, and so, like, God tricked the devil, 
to take power from him over men. And so that's, I don't think that's what the scripture teaches, but that's kind of what they get from this. But that was a pretty popular view. Um, but it's interesting that, uh, and so it's like Jesus became a man at, like at, as us, and he died for us so that we may, you know, live uh, to him and have life eternal. So, like, he came and lived, you know, temporarily, you know, like we do, to give us that eternal life. And deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So, you know, there's no reason to be, to fear anything, you know, when you're with Christ, especially death. Um, you know, like uh, Paul said, and I don't know if it was Romans or I guess it was Corinthians, he said, oh, death, where is there thy sting? That's what he means is that there's no reason to fear death because we're going to go on to live with the Lord. We're going to be resurrected spiritually and, uh, you know, that takes the sting out of death, doesn't it? Because it, it's really just like a transition for us to go on to the next life, to a better life. Uh, you know, but for people who aren't believers in Christ, that's not so much the case. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And so this speaks to the Hebrews, to the Jews that he's writing to. He's saying he took on the seed of Abraham. You know, he was born into that, uh, the Jewish, you know, bloodline of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest, and things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Again, this is, you know, and, is, and there's going to be a lot of this, and, and I don't understand everything, but, you know, he's going to talk about the Old Testament types, and, you know, he mentions the high priest, and, you know, how the priests in the Old Testament made reconciliation, you know, through animal sacrifices and stuff, but in this sense, you know, he sacrificed himself for all men, you know, and not just... Uh, one person or anything like that and so this is more focused towards the Hebrews and stuff so they understand this um, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted so he's been tempted just like men and that's where that ends which seems kind of like a random ending but I guess that you know the, the original Bible doesn't have chapters and verses right but that's fine there's a lot there, you know, there's going to be a lot in every chapter. There's a lot in every chapter of the Bible, obviously. But, you know, Hebrews, there's a lot here. It's all about Jesus so far. Uh, you know, straightforward, directly about Christ. But amazing. You know, it's wonderful. So, I guess that, uh, I'll end that there, and hopefully I'll get on with the, uh, next chapter pretty soon. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you guys think. Leave comments. Uh, let me know if you think that I got anything wrong or anything else that you would like me to do, to look at, to study. Any questions that you have. Any more insight that you can bring to this. Thank you. And God bless. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. This is
is the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, took, him, took on himself the nature of a man. He was crucified and died for our sins, and he rose again on the third day. To ask you the most important question of your life, your joy or sorrow for all eternity depends on your answer to this question. Are you saved? This has nothing to do with how good you are or if you go to a building called a church. But are you born again? In John chapter 3 verse 7, Jesus said, you must be born again. How can you be born again? First of all, you must realize that you are a sinner. Sin is anything in us that does not express or is contrary to the holy nature of our Creator, God. For instance, have you ever lied or cheated or stolen? These are all contrary to the character of God. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 when it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because you are a sinner, you are condemned to death. For the wages or the payment of sin is death. We read that in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. This includes eternal separation from God in hell. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. But God loved you so much he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to bear your sin and die in your place. He hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Jesus had to shed his blood and die, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Although we cannot understand how, God said my sins and your sins were laid upon Jesus and he died in our place. He became our substitute. It is true, God cannot lie. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent in Acts chapter 17 verse 30. To repent means to turn around to confess and forsake one's sins. It's a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of attitude that abhors sins. It agrees with God that one is a sinner and also agrees that Jesus died for us on the cross. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simply believe on him as the one who bore your sin, died in your place, was buried, and whom God resurrected. His resurrection powerfully assures that the believer can claim everlasting life when Jesus is received as Savior. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 verse 12 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved Romans chapter 10 verse 13 Whosoever includes you shall be saved means not maybe nor can but shall be saved If you would like to learn more about sin salvation the Lord Jesus Christ or anything else concerning the Christian faith please visit www.acceptgbconverted.com